The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offering. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes with Plein Air and Fine Art Connoisseur Magazine. I hope you're enjoying yourself and stretching yourself and learning something new. Today we're going to teach you about light, motion, and drama with the incredible Nancy Boren. Hi, I'm Nancy Boren. Welcome to my oil painting workshop. I grew up in a painting household. My dad was a wonderful painter and a wonderful father. He always had his studio at our house, so I grew up watching him mix his paints. I watched him choose his subjects. Our walls were covered with paintings. He had paintings on the way to galleries. Um, all of our childhood vacations were taken to Santa Fe or the Grand Canyon, places he could paint go to galleries, go to museums, so I can't imagine a life without art. I then went to college. I got a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree. There was nothing else that I wanted to be involved with except art, and I've taken many professional workshops. I've painted for several decades, and today I am going to do a backlit painting with transparent fabric. So let's get started. The first kind of lighting we're going to talk about is ambient lighting. Ambient lighting is simply a general lighting. The light can be coming from different directions, maybe partly from the window, partly from a lamp, an overhead light. It just does not have any strong cast shadows on the figure. You don't want half of the face in shadow. That's not ambient lighting. The great thing about ambient lighting is that you can use lots of detail in the background and you don't have any strong areas of shadow so you can see all those lovely details if you're wanting to do a painting that includes those kinds of things. You can still have very dramatic darks and lights like I have in this painting but your darks will come from the local color of the objects in the painting either objects in the background or the way your model is dressed or the color of your model's hair. In this painting, she makes a whole big dark silhouette. She does have two colors on her, black and blue, but they're both a lot darker than the background. The background is a medium value. It has a few light parts in it. Um, for some reason, a dark against a mid-tone is considered to be a really great combination. I have heard several artists say that through the years, and I've read it. So if you are trying to set up a model one day, you want to do a painting, and you know the world is full of possibilities, you don't really know what to choose, I would suggest trying this. Get a model with either dark hair or a dark costume, a dark hat, dark clothing, and put up something, anything, in the background that's a mid-value. I mean, it looks great with a white background too, but somehow it looks really rich like this. It almost makes me think of stained glass windows. You have the really beautiful saturated colors, but you have all the really dark outlines and it makes the colors look even richer. I don't have any direct shadows under the nose. There's no strong light on her. There are always going to be shadows under the chin, 
as she has here. She had black hair, so I had a lot of drama to work with just from my model. In this painting, the darks come from, again, her dark hair, and the shadows created up under the fabric. But there's no strong light. If there's no big shadow under the nose, you know you do not have strong directional light. You have soft ambient light. She had dark eyes, so that helps give you a little dark accent spot. Uh, and again, I had some very busy fabric. I chose not to use all the busyness of the background. I wanted to put the busyness on her costume. These two paintings are both examples of using a figure that has a lot of dark on her against a mid-tone background. And your mid-tone on a value scale could be a five, six, or a seven, just something that is not black and it's not white. We've just talked about ambient lighting, so now I'd like to talk about dramatic lighting. Dramatic lighting is a chance to add some mystery and drama to your subject. You can do it all different ways. The, the way I have chosen today is to do it directly from the top up above the model. When you do that, you can cast the eye sockets into shadow and you can't see the eyes very well and that kind of creates some mystery. You get a lot of great cast shadows from under the nose and under the chin onto the body. In these two paintings that you see here, I have used the same kind of dramatic lighting from up above the model and in front. The one of Mamma Mia casts her face into a little more shadow than the one of Four Corners Cowboy. With Mamma Mia, she had very blonde hair and the light was right above her hair, so that was the lightest part of the painting. As you go down, of course her nose catches the light, it throws her whole face into shadow, the light travels down to her chest, it's a little farther for the light to go to her baby bump and then it's even farther for it to hit her thigh. And I noticed that there was a gradation of light there as I was looking at the model, and when I did the painting, I decided that would be fun to play this up a little bit. I love gradations of light and color, so I intentionally played up the light to the dark parts of the painting for some drama. And when you have a lovely cast shadow of the head on the chest, then the light is hitting her shoulder over here and it's bouncing up all this wonderful light onto the side of her face. It really helps you build the three-dimensional quality of the head. I kind of, I don't have exactly the same thing over here with Four Corners Cowboy. The light was a little bit more in front of his face so his cheekbones are catching more of the light. But you can see how the light from his kerchief was hitting his neck. So you get these wonderful reflected lights. The trick is with this kind of dramatic lighting, you don't want these lights to get too light. If you squint your eyes, those parts of the paintings still stay in the shadows, that were in the shadows. Same thing down here with his fist. The underneath side of his fingers is catching the light from the top of the cowboy hat. But if you squint your eyes, the shadowed parts of his hands stay in this shadow and the light parts, along with the black shirt that's catching the light, stay in the light. So to paint objects that are different colors, like this dark shirt and his skin, but they're both in the strong light, you just have to squint your eyes and really be sure that you're keeping the values organized. When you're looking at the bounced light in a shadow, be sure that you squint your eyes so you can see the value of the shadow and the value of the light. Because if you're getting all this bounce light that's a different color up into the shadow, it's very exciting and you want to get that color and light in there, but you've got to keep the value down so that the shadow parts all look like they're in the shadow. So just squint your eyes. And of course, it's kind of tough when you're getting reflected yellows, warms, and reds into the shadow because those are all colors that are not dark. So that's a place where you can use some transparent paint or other ways to get the color into the dark part of the shadow. The third kind of lighting we're going to talk about today is backlighting. And that's when your light source is directly behind your objects. Often it creates a rim light, which here I have on the top of her dress and her head. Over here, 
It's around her face and a little bit on her hair. That always creates a dramatic spot because you have the dark part of the shadow and the lightest light. So you want to really pay attention where that is. In this lighting in the sunshine outside that day, her dress looked very warm. A lot of times when the light comes through fabric, you're gonna get the areas of the most saturated color. But you can see on her shadow especially, on her shoulder here in the shadow, this is the blue of the shadow on her. The grass is really green and the sun was hitting it so it's bouncing up underneath her chin. That's a slightly green color there. The sunlight was hitting the side of her little brother's face and bouncing over so you can see that warm side of her face there is more of a red color. And those are subtle differences but they really will relate parts of the painting to each other because this green is now partly in her dress, it's partly on his shirt, it's on the front of her dress, and it's under her chin. So all those objects have a different local color, but they're all related now because they have bits of the green in them. In this example with the coral dress, the blue of the sky was still reflecting into the shadow area, but the blue and the coral mix and you end up with a lavender kind of color. So you just have to squint your eyes, keep things in the shadow, in the shadow, no matter how exciting the colors may look as they bounce up. And it's super exciting when the green grass is bouncing up under someone's chin or nose. It looks really fun. And that's a great way to keep uh, your painting unified because you've got color from one piece bouncing up onto another piece. And so then you have green over here and green over here. And paintings are always unified when you can have one bit of this color somewhere else in the painting. We've talked about three different ways to light your model so far. And I've shown examples of my paintings. But now we have a model on the set. Her name is Amy. And she's going to help me show what it's like to have a real life person here. I have a setup behind me that I used in one of my paintings and it is busy, has a pattern, but it is a medium value all the way across. It's not black, it's not white, it's somewhere in the middle. So why don't you wrap this around your shoulders? Remember I talked about how it's a really nice combination to have a model in dark clothing against a medium value background. Here she's got black pants, gray top and blue, but if you squint your eyes, she's all pretty much one dark shape against this interesting background. Here's another option. I have this really colorful shawl. Yeah, you hand me that one. And put that one on kind of the same way. Instead of plain uh, clothing, now this one has a lot of pattern too. You can always turn clothes inside out, too. If the color's a little too bright, you can get a nicer look from the inside. And if I change this, maybe if I pull this down a little bit, now I've covered up some of that pattern. So maybe just this little bit is okay. I might choose to emphasize the pattern that's real simple up here. But if you squint your eyes again, she still is a dark shape against the medium value. And she has brown hair but you could always paint it as black. We're artists, we have imaginations. It's easy to shift the values a little bit of something. And to create an interesting silhouette, you can always add a hat or a headdress, a scarf. And now she's got this really great silhouette against this dark or the lighter background. You can tilt the hat, we could push it back on her head, and all of that's gonna create a different shape. I buy a lot of things at yard sales and you never know what you're going to do with them until you get them. We can create all different looks by changing the angle of the hat. Who knows what you might do with it? This one fortunately has a wire rim so you can bend it and shape it like you want to get whatever look you want. The great thing about having your model dressed in a dark outfit also is that all these little ornaments show up really well. So if she had this necklace on, look how dramatic that is. You get a great silhouette with that jewelry. And you see all the details in her bracelet. 
So if, if we had dramatic lighting and her arm was in shadow, you would lose all that. So if you want to do a painting and be able to show a lot of these lovely details, this soft ambient light is probably the way to go. So let's move on now to a little bit more difficult situation and use dramatic lighting. Here's a great example of dramatic lighting. We have the same model, she's in a different outfit, and we change the background. We're lucky here in the studio to have this nice big black background, but when I'm in my studio, that's not the case. I may take my photos, I may do my paintings, with all of the typical stuff that's all around on the floor, you just edit that out. That's kind of the artist's job, is to pick and choose the things that you want in a painting. We have a spotlight right above her, coming down on her face. So right now, the light is just catching her nose, which I really like. It's casting the rest of her face into shadow, and she's looking kind of mysterious. But if she steps back just a little bit, you'll see there's more and more light on her face. And now it's catching her cheekbones, and that can look really great too. So come forward a little. Maybe turn your face that way. Turn it back this way. Sometimes just the smallest moves will catch different planes of the face. And so it's really great just to take your time, look at your light, look at your model, try different things out, see what really catches your attention. Now I'm gonna talk about bounced light. Right now, the light is coming down and hitting her shoulder. It's bouncing up onto her face but the skin is the same color in both places. So the bounce light may not be quite as apparent. If she had lime green on her shoulder, you can really see the green bouncing onto her face. That'll help unify those two different objects. If she had red on, you can really see the red color up on her face. The trick is, with bounced light, you have to keep it in the shadow. Because if you squint your eyes, and look at her face, it's in the shadow. And you may get really excited because you're getting to paint that red, but you've got to keep it in the shadow. Now, when you have white, it really, really bounces a lot of light into her face. And at this point, the shadow may almost be halfway between the darker part of the shadow and the light side of her face. Just pay attention to the values and paint them just like you see them. And now I want to talk a moment about the fabric. This is a really heavy knit, and it falls really nicely. It drapes in a really pretty way. I have had this folded in my studio for months, and I took it out the other day, and it looked great. There's no wrinkles at all. It probably has a lot of spandex in it. I can't tell you exactly what the blend is, but when you go to the fabric store, unroll a couple yards on the bolt and see how the fabric acts. If I had cotton out here, it wouldn't drape like this. This just has the most beautiful folds in it, and that's why I bought it. I didn't go intending to get anything that was lime green, but once I fell in love with the fabric, I thought, I'll figure out how to use the green. So Amy, if you would turn around. You can see that we've just clipped it together. We've wrapped it around her a couple of times. Now turn back around. And because it's stretchy, it really follows all the curves. So you don't have to know how to sew. You don't have to find a dress that will perfectly fit a model. Um, I think I bought about three and a half yards of fabric, and that was it. It's enough to make an evening gown <laughs> and a shawl. <laughs> so let's put this extra part that I cut off around, and you can just play with the fabric and see what kinds of shapes it can come up with. So if she, this almost looks like she has sleeves on the dress she can throw it over one shoulder and make an off, she can make a scarf, she can make an off-shoulder gown. See, she had a little triangle of flesh there. That looked kind of cool. And all you need is another clip, put another clip in the back, and there you go. So you can have a lot of fun using your imagination if you get the right piece of fabric. Now that we've talked about ambient lighting and dramatic lighting, let's move on to the third and final kind of lighting we're going to cover, and that's backlighting. Now we have the model set up with the backlight. The painting I did was actually the bright sun in the late evening, but a light in your studio works just as well too. Of course, a strong light coming through almost any fabric will show some color and light, but when you have it with transparent fabric, you absolutely cannot go wrong. 
When I went to the fabric store, the only thing I had in mind was this particular color. I wanted a rich pink, a salmon, an orange, a red, something that was very vibrant and warm colored. And I got the idea to use props because I do like to have a little bit of a narrative in my painting. And I thought about a lot of different kinds of props. Finally decided on balloons because balloons are a little bit whimsical. They're happy. Everybody loves balloons. And so I got a whole group of them. So then your question becomes, how many balloons to use? Well, right now we've got what, five or six, and that's a little too many. Your painting can actually become more about the balloons than about the girl. And I wanted it to be about the movement of the girl and jumping. So I went to the party store, and they had incredible balloons. Some of them were marbleized balloons with a bunch of colors swirled together, and that's what I really wanted to buy. But then I pulled myself back, and I'm thinking about this beautiful coral-colored dress, and I thought, no, if I put a lot of green balloons, then I'm going to have to juggle all these colors, and I already have a sunset behind her, so that's not going to work. So let's take two balloons away. And so now I think I have a much more manageable group of balloons. And my model was running and jumping, so some of them were flying out behind her. And I'll talk more about that when we talk about the composition of the painting. But the balloons are like the fabric. They're very flexible. They can move all over. They're fluid. And so they're really great props to use because in the composition part of your painting, you can kind of make them do whatever you want. If you're making a costume to use in a painting, you do not have to have it perfect. If it was for photography, that would be a different thing. But as you can see, or I hope you can see here, the hem of her top is not even hemmed. It's all ravelly. I kind of ran out of time, and I thought, I really don't have to do that. And I'm not going to paint all those little ravels in my painting. She's got elastic in the sleeves and the top. I wanted the elastic here because it gave the sleeve a more interesting shape than if it was just down along her arm. But if you were close up, you could see the white of the elastic through the fabric. But again, that doesn't matter because I'm not going to paint it that way. Also, this comes out too much, but I wasn't about to re-sew it at that point. So when I get to the composition part of my painting, I just kind of cut it in. It's really easy. One brush stroke, you can take off five or ten pounds off someone. You can change their clothes. It's awesome. Now, one problem I did have with this fabric that I did not anticipate is that it's very, very slick. And it slides right off of itself. So I wanted some cuffs because I liked all the layering that this created, and I knew the light coming through it would catch all those layers. But during the modeling session, as I had my model running back and forth in front of the sun, I finally had to just pin it up. So I have safety pins here and down here because I wanted the skirt to have some layers too, and that was the only way I could get them. But again, it's not going to show up. One of the keys to painting transparent fabric is just, again, to look at the values and paint it the way it really is. If you only have one, put your arm up, Amy. If you only have one layer of fabric, it's going to be pretty light. If you have two layers, it's going to be darker. Anywhere you have a seam, you have several layers of fabric, it's going to look like a dark line. Put your arm down. Anytime you have fabric that's coming up and going over, you're actually kind of looking through the thickness of the fabric. So that's almost going to be like a tiny little outline, too. So if you paint this fairly light in the middle with a dark edge and dark where the seams are, it's going to look transparent. And one more thing about it not looking perfect. You never know exactly what size your model will be. So I just have this safety pinned back here, and her leotard shows through. But that's OK, because I'm not going to paint that. I'm going to make those adjustments when I start my painting. So don't overthink the process of making a costume. Just do the best that you can to get it to look like what your vision is, and then work your magic at the easel with your painting. We've talked about ambient lighting, dramatic lighting, and backlit lighting. So for this painting I'm doing in this workshop today, I'm going to focus on backlight. I have a reference photo. I, ha I got my idea. I had my vision. 
And so then I got all the pieces together to make it happen. I couldn't possibly paint this girl with her arms in the air if she was actually standing there doing it. She would not be able to last, so I chose to do it from a photograph. This girl lives down the street from me. She's posed for me lots of times. She takes ballet lessons. So I knew that she was tall and slim and graceful, and she was the right kind of model for this project. Um, I live in a neighborhood that has a golf course, and it's near a lake. So I knew there was one spot on the golf course late in the afternoon where the west sun was going to come across the water. And that wasn't really important to me, but what I knew was the horizon would be very low, and I would have a whole sky behind the girl with very little trees or anything in the background. And I just wanted her floating in space. I wanted a girl jumping. I wanted it to look like a girl was off the ground, kind of in an ethereal moment. So I also knew ahead of time what color scheme I wanted for the painting. This painting was a result of a previous painting I did called Thunder on the Brazos. And that was a girl jumping. I had never painted a girl jumping before, but I really enjoyed that one. That one had a cool color scheme. So I thought I want to explore that idea a little more, and I'm going to do one with a warm color scheme. So, of course, a sunset came to mind, and I wanted to dress my model in warm colors. So you saw the dress that I made, and so I put it on my model. We went down. She ran back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and I took lots and lots of photos and gave her tips along the way. Okay, this time, don't put your legs out like this, don't put your arms out like that, and we just tried a lot of different things. So after I reviewed all the photos, this was the one that I really liked. I liked it because it was not strictly a ballet kind of jump, but when you have this many variable parts and everything is moving, you can never get a photograph that's going to be perfect in every way. And nature is wonderful and it's inspiring, but it's not art. This is where art happens. So I've got my basic pose, my basic kind of colors, but I had to make changes to it. In the photo, very unfortunately, her dress looks like a chicken drumstick shape here, and it has this really dark line across the bottom. That was not something I wanted in the photo. Also, I mean in the painting, also her top is really billowing out in the back, and I wanted it to be more uh, form hugging there. So those are two changes I can make very, very easily. If I had painted this painting like this with things like fabric that you can change in the blink of an eye, uh, I would have not been making good decisions. It would not have been attractive. So whenever you have variables in a painting that can easily be changed, like balloons, props, fabric, change them. Make a good design. If you're familiar with my painting Cimarron Solstice, which I did from this a couple of years ago, you will see how I changed the direction of her skirt. She's jumping in an arc. So I used the skirt to echo and I, and that movement, and I gave it a diagonal line. So this is much nicer than this angle over here with this big billow in the front. One other thing that I wanted to change after I studied this was her knee. I felt like with her knee bent, it just stopped the motion. It just kept her back, and I wanted her to feel like she was moving forward. So I straightened her leg out. You know, I'm not a great anatomist, but I can do that, and I wanted to change the angle of her leg a little bit, so I made it go down just a little bit more, again to kind of create that arc of movement. I felt like two balloons were nice. We actually had three in the photo shoot, and in all the running and jumping, one of them popped. Those things happen. You have to be flexible. So I thought I need some more balloons. And balloons, just like fabric, are something that are very, very easy to change. And so there would be absolutely no reason to not do a nice design with the balloons. I liked the two balloons that she had with that hand, but I thought, where could I put some more? If I put one over here, again, this is almost like the knee stopping her motion. And if she is moving, the balloons would probably go from her hand back. 
So that's probably not a good idea. So if I put one right in the middle, not really touching anything, I think that's a little confusing. You don't know if it's way back there. You don't know if it's up here. Um, I think things that are overlapped are much nicer, and it helps lock shapes together into one overall big shape. So I thought, well, if I put this one up here, that would be kind of nice, help create this echoing arc of her movement. But if these are exactly the same level, I just didn't really like that. So I tried this up here, and I thought, oh, that's much nicer. It's more graceful. It makes a little variety in the way the balloons are. It makes the shape of this balloon a little smaller than the shape of this one. And I try to use uneven numbers of things. I mean, that's a typical thing. Use one or three or five objects instead of two or four. But you don't always have to do those things. I felt like another balloon would be nice. I could have put it here. I like the transparent balloons because you can see through them. You don't have to change your color scheme. You have an overlapping object. So that might have been all right. Sometimes there's a lot of ways you can solve these things. I finally ended up adding one over here. Then I have balloon, hand, person, hand, and balloon. It kind of has all these objects that are stepping back, and I really like that feeling. Before we go into the materials I'm going to be using, I want to show you how I sometimes write down my goals. I find it very helpful um, when you have your vision of your painting, you have your big overall idea. You need to write it down. I write it and stick it up on my easel a lot of times because after two hours, three hours, four hours into your painting and you're finding challenge after challenge, maybe with the drawing, with the color mixing, whatever it is, it's very easy to lose sight of what your big idea was at the beginning. You're just trying to put out fires and solve problems. So I want a warm sunset color scheme. I want red, orange, and yellows in my painting. I want to keep that in mind. My overall feeling of this scene was that it was glowing and it was warm and she was right in front of the sun. So I don't want to forget that. I want movement in my painting. She was moving, but I need to figure out ways I can maybe blur the edges of the paint, maybe draw action lines around her, almost like in a cartoon strip, but in a more subtle way to show the movement of the girl and the balloons. And I have languid abandon up here because those were just words that came to mind when I looked at her hands. I absolutely loved the way her hand was holding the balloons. She wasn't grabbing it with a tight fist. She had been doing this for an hour and she was getting really loose and relaxed and I just thought that was interesting. That was just a little quirk that the model did that I didn't suggest that I really liked and picked up on. So at the end of the painting, I will look at these written words off to the side of my easel and I'll remember what my plan was and I hope I will have achieved it. And if I haven't, then I'll just go back and correct it to get these on there. I use a variety of brushes. I mostly use stiff bristle brushes in different sizes. It just depends on the painting and it depends on what part of the painting I'm working on. Anything from a 12 to a 2, I usually like flats. I never ever buy filberts. I just don't like them. But all brushes end up being filberts after they get worn down. Once in a while, I buy brights, which are a shorter brush like that. They don't have as much spring to them as the longer brushes. Um, but they're okay. And then I have a very few very small brushes for fine details. I also use some very soft brushes on occasion. These are wonderful brushes for, say you have a line like this, brushing across it, grabbing part of the paint and pulling it. And so when I'm trying to create movement and motion with my model in this painting, I'll be using those to kind of blur some of the edges. Now, my paint. I do paintings with all different color schemes. And I think color is very, very difficult. It's very challenging for me. 
Um, when I'm feeling frustrated and I'm not getting the result I want, I will stop and I will do a painting with a very limited palette. And I think that's a really good thing to do for everyone. Um, and Zorn did that, of course. He has the famous Zorn palette, which is yellow ochre, cadmium red light, white, and black. And it's just amazing what kind of paintings you can do with that. And there are lovely color charts people have made you can see on the internet, and even better, do your own, and then you'll really understand it. Uh, incredible lavenders and all kinds of colors that you can make with these four. These colors, to me, this is almost like a Zorn palette, but with little added parts to it. So I'm using cadmium yellow light, and when you put things out on your palette, be sure that you put enough paint. I think I'm as guilty of that as a lot of people. And put things out in an organized fashion. Um, there's no special way you have to do it, but you need to do it kind of the same every time. So you know where your paint is. If you're reaching for your reds and you've put the blues there that day, then you're going to be searching around, what did I do? You get the wrong thing on your brush and it just ends up being a mess. I have taught workshops and I've come along and said, why don't you have some red out here? I'll never forget this one day. And the girl says, okay. So she got some red and she squeezed it right in the middle of the palette. <laughs> and her colors were kind of dotted all over. There was no rhyme or reason. And the, the piles of paint were actually in the way of the mixing area. So she just wasn't really thinking about it. She wasn't organized. And uh, that is just not the way to do. If you paint a lot, get really organized. You can put your white anywhere you want. I like to put it in the middle, at the top. You can put it at the bottom. Some, you can put two piles of white if you want. Use one for darker colors, one for lighter colors. Whatever seems to work for you. I kind of like to arrange mine. Cadmium red light around to the yellows to the white. And then I put the blues, the greens, the blacks on the other side. And then I put my dark reds over here. I don't know why I've ended up doing that through the years, but I have. And then as I add colors, take colors away, I'm probably not going to be using much black, but it's great to mix with cadmium red light and white to make a very warm lavender. And in this painting, of course, I have the girl in the reddish dress with the shadow color coming in. So the blue of the sky and the shadow and the red dress are going to make a lavender. And I'll put some ultramarine because I'll need that for the sky. But I may not need that much. And I'm just not sure if I need a little bit warmer blue. So this is manganese blue hue. I could use a dash of phthalo blue or something, but that's what I'm going to put out here today. So there you go with my palette. I have marked the center of my canvas because I'm going to put two grid lines just to help me get my figure on the canvas without struggling too much with that. And I would like to tell you what kind of canvas I'm using. I'm using oil primed linen that I buy in big rolls. Then I cut it up and glue it with Miracle Muck onto a piece of masonite. And the Miracle Muck is reversible with heat. It will come off. So I like that. I like a rigid board usually if it, to paint on. If it's something larger, of course, it's got to be a stretch canvas. And I love the oil primed surface because the paint moves around on there. Gesso is a lot more absorbent. And it, I just find it harder to work with. So I've got my tick marks on here. And I'm not going to use white. At this point, I just want a dark color, but kind of a transparent color to just barely get some lines up here so I can see what I'm doing. So I'm just going to put this up here just kind of real gently. And then all this will be painted over or rubbed off. Okay, now I can kind of see where I am, and I have my photograph here. 
So, and I've already got a grid drawn on my photograph. The size of my canvas. Of course, I'm cutting this balloon off. So her head, her neck is starting right here, and then her head is taking up not quite half of that space. So it's going to be something about like that. Once I have a shape, and her head is crucial in this painting, once I have that established, I want to try to stick with those little lines, and I want to build everything else off of that. It's very easy for the head to end up too large it, because it's the center of interest. It's very easy for the eyes to end up too big in the head because in the face you're usually looking at the eyes. So you, you can't keep making things bigger and bigger. Everything will go off the canvas. And believe me, I've done it. I've made every mistake that it's possible to make. And because her head is tilted down, this is going to make the drawing a little bit tricky. Any time a person's head is tilted, down or up or any direction, it somehow throws people off. And of course, we all know that all the features are parallel to each other. Even if I turn my head, all the features are still parallel. It's just my neck that has bent. But I have heard people in painting classes say their tendency is to try and straighten all that out as they paint. And they know they're doing it, but it still is hard to do. When I've done figures who are very tilted, I even sometimes will take my reference and I'll turn my easel and I will paint the head straight up and then put my painting back down because I find myself tilting my head so that my head is lined up with the model's head. And I think that must be a human reaction. So anyway, with her face tilted down, I am going to have to really pay attention to that to getting that right, but to getting her features right. But at this moment, I'm not going to have to worry about that. And I'm nearsighted. I wear glasses. I take them off to paint sometimes. Sometimes it's actually an advantage because you just see the big shapes. You don't see eyelashes and fingernails and things. So I'm probably going to be taking them off and putting them on the whole time I'm painting. So we all have vision issues, <laughs> perhaps. I want to know where the top of her head is. And then, of course, where her arm is. That's going to be kind of crucial. And, of course, I can measure. I feel like her arms and her proportions are fine in the photograph. You do have to pay attention to that. Things can be very foreshortened and it depends on the way the photograph is taken. Something out front can look way too big. If a photograph was taken of me looking down, my feet would look teeny tiny. So you ha do have to be aware of that. I like the shape of her hand very much. Okay, now I'm thinking that's probably not, that may be too far out there. Her little neck is coming right down to that center line. The great thing about using paint to draw with is it's very, very flexible. I can change everything. If I have something wrong, I can just wipe it off. Like I think this might need to go forward a little more. And then I can wipe this part off, and it's, and if I, I think, how far out is her hand going? Oh, I think that might be too far. It's real simple to start over, so no pressure. And always measure, measure the top of this to the top of this. Find some point and measure everything off of that. So the top of her head and the top of this hand are about the same. So I'm just going to lower that a little bit. This part is really important, getting everything where it needs to be on the canvas. I have sometimes worked several hours and think this looks great, and I start painting, and I come back the next day and say, no, 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 that is just not it. And I hate to take it all off, but I just scrub it all off and start over because 
if you don't have your shapes and your, your drawing right, it is just going to be a mess. No amount of good color, no amount of anything else is going to fix it. And I just don't ever seem to be the kind of painter who can make every stage of a painting look really good. I have seen painters who can do that. And uh, I'm not one of them. <laughs> Very unfortunately, it's like sometimes it looks really good at the beginning, and then it goes through this really awful phase, but then I can usually fix it. And sometimes that's half the battle to realize what's wrong. Then you know what to fix. But you've got to get started. You can't be paralyzed by... Uh, indecision or wanting everything perfect. You just have to get started. Okay, this hand is coming up like this. Maybe, maybe her head is a tiny bit too big. And I know sometimes it's really tempting to project an image up here and just trace around it, but I would suggest that you not do that because the reason I am who I am is because of the way I do things. It's like my signature. And if my figures all end up a little too skinny, if they all end up a little too curvy, a little too angular, whatever it is, that's like my handwriting. And if you just trace around your image, you are losing that incredible opportunity to have your unique look to the way you draw the figure, to the way you divide the space up. So don't, don't forego that. Just know that this is going to be maybe a little bit painful, but it'll all be worth it. And she has this, this really interesting little gesture with her hand that I'll work out later. And that's a little too big. No big deal. Okay. And then you can put just some lines. The moment you put any kind of line out here, you have addressed the fact that you have a whole rectangle that you're working with. You're not just creating an isolated figure in the middle of it. The background is as much a part of the, the figure, I mean, as a part of the painting as the figure is. They have to work together. You want air around your figure. So the background isn't, don't think of it as just a flat space. Think of it as a three-dimensional space, and you're trying to figure out a way to paint the air in front of her and behind her. So let's see. Her nose. Let's draw a straight line from her nose down. And what do we have? Her entire body is behind her nose. Sometimes you just don't know until you measure something how it is because you need to paint what you see, not what you think you see, because what you think you see is probably not what you're seeing. And I think I'm going to move her arm back a little bit more. And now let's see. Where's her nose going to be? And at home, I would have music playing. I think a lot of people do like to listen to something when they work. It kind of takes your mind away a little bit so that your subconscious can take over. And sometimes when you don't overthink these things, things actually turn out better. So let's say if her nose is right there, kind of drop that line straight down. Then, I want her body back a little bit farther. So, she's a very sweet young girl. She's got a little bit of curves. She, her back was really arched. And 
And of course, I'm going to want to work on the design of the dress after I know where she's going to be. And I really want to pay attention to where I stop and, and what the size of this negative space is. One of the things that helped me decide how to do this composition was something that my professor, one of my professors in college said. And I am not a person with a scientific mind. And I do not use the golden mean or dynamic symmetry or any of those kinds of compositional aids. I just don't think that way. My brain just freezes up. But he said something that after 40 years I've never forgotten. And he said, make every corner different and you'll probably have an interesting composition. And that's something really low tech and really simple that I can remember. So, let's see about that. What do we have here? And by making each one different, you can look at the value, the color, and the shapes, the negative space and the positive space. So I'm going to have the other two balloons over here. So this corner is going to be kind of an odd, interesting shape. This hand is higher than this hand, so it's making an interesting negative shape over here. So these two are different. They're going to have a very similar color because I'm going to have a blue across the top of the sky. These two corners are going to be a similar color, but again the negative shapes are going to be very different. This one's going to cut down into and leave this little bit of space. This leg is going to be coming through, which is totally different than that one. So for me, I'm satisfied that I have four different corners. So, I, so I, that's another thing that I want to remember. When you make a game plan, Keep it in mind. So as her leg is coming down, I want to pay attention to where the dress is going to hit. And then see, just take some of that off because I'm not going to need that anymore. I only need this little bit to get her situated. And anytime you put some of the figure color on the background, or some of the background in the figure color, you're helping unify the painting. The number one thing you're doing here is not a painting of a girl in balloons. The number one thing is you're making a painting. The painting has to be unified. You have to make something that is a whole. And that usually involves making the colors work together. So, who knows? A few of these little dark strokes may eventually show through some of those strokes that I put on later to be the sky. And in some little tiny subtle way, that may help relate to the dark as that's going to be here on her hair. All right, and her, the back of her knee is about where her wrist is here. So anytime you can find something that lines up that helps you get things where they're supposed to be, then pay attention. Maybe that could be a little longer because the back of her leg is coming down and then her calf is coming up. But I want to have that interesting negative space there, so I maybe need to bring that leg up just a little bit. I usually paint with this sitting right on the edge, but I don't know if that will work here today. And then I have, I have this little area, and in the photograph, this is another choice that you make with everything that you form for your painting. I don't want any attention right there where her legs come together. So I am not going to paint it that way. I'm going to because the fabric is extremely fluid and it can do anything that I, the artist, want. I will just drape a few folds of fabric across there. So, All right, back up to this hand. Let's get this hand fixed here. I need to get this hand back in here. I have the wrist bent. I think I had it bent too much. Everything is just kind of gauging. Is it too much? Is it too big? Is it going the right direction? 
hand is usually the length of a person's face. And on her hair here, I think I have her ponytail too, a little too low. And of course the hair is another place where you can make it any shape you want. But I like this shape of her hair because she's a modern girl and she does her hair in those little popular messy buns. And she pulls, for this deal, she had pulled her hair through a ponytail holder, but she left the tail not pulled all the way through, so it made kind of a big messy bun. And I like that because it's a very 21st century kind of hairdo. You would have never seen anyone in the 1950s with a messy bun or with her hair not pulled through the ponytail holder, I don't think. So that'll kind of show that she is from the time she's from, and I like that. This is going to be my center of interest. So I'm going to have my darkest dark and my lightest light here. So that kind of all worked out well. It's just how it ended up on the photo, and that is exactly what I wanted. I'm going to have this nice rim light. Let me get a different brush. I tend to go back and pull the lights out then later. I mean, right now, so I can kind of see where I'm going. So I'm going to have this nice bright rim light that's coming down the side of her hair and then down the side of her face. And I need to really look at the angle of her nose. It's from the vertical, it's going that way a little bit at the bottom. And this is where I've got to really pay attention because her face is angled and her mouth is going to be very crucial to be, and I will work on those little details later. Now I need the balloons before I go any farther. Sometimes I've done hours on a painting and I realize I totally didn't even see something that the model was wearing. And I think that happens to everybody, but it's very odd. You can get so, <laughs> you can get so focused on one part, then you didn't even notice another piece of it that you meant to include. And balloons can be any size you want, which is kind of the nice thing. I remember thinking when I was starting this, um, the balloons were kind of the size of her head. And did I really want to have all these other similar shapes to her head the same size? And I thought, I think I'll make them a little bit bigger, just to give it a little variety. And then, this one's going to be coming in front a little bit and behind. And now we've got these three nice, interesting shapes that are overlapping each other, and they kind of connect to make one big shape. Anytime you can overlap your darks and your lights or other shapes, your painting's always going to look stronger. Now this one I can put just as much as I want here. I'm going to have this one because balloons do just bump against each other sometimes. And I have these two overlapping, so I don't feel like I have to overlap that one. I could do it either way. And then this little hand was also really lovely, the way she had her fingers out. Ballerinas try to make what they're doing look so effortless. and they're doing all these things that take incredible strength, but yet their hands and arms look relaxed. It's so amazing. So I want to be sure and capture that, the shape of her fingers, which I will work on a little bit later. The last thing I would want to concentrate on right now is little tiny things. I'm trying to get the big shapes, my roadmap, if you will, where I'm going. I don't want to look at fingernails or eyelashes or little tiny bits with the dress or anything. But I do want this balloon going in front of her hand. 
and I, I like the idea of having the edge of this balloon coming inside the edge of this one, but maybe I have too much of that one showing. And I do, I do not want the top of this balloon to line up with the top of her head. I want something that's going up here. So for now, I think we'll do that, but I think I will make this one a little smaller. There's just a little less of it showing. So now I would say my preliminary step is done. I know where all my pieces are going to go, oh, except for one. I did want to kind of mark where I'm going to make a color change in my sky. It's going to be in this area. The top of it's going to be bluer, and I don't want this again just straight. That's a little bit static. I want to make it a little bit more of an angle. So we'll say about like that. I want my sky to fade from blue down into a rosy color, a yellow-orange, and then I'm going to have just bits of a pretty strong cadmium yellow around the figure as highlights. That's my plan. We will see. I have my preliminary drawing down. I have my road map. I know where I'm going. I know where my shapes are. So now I'm going to go ahead and put a thin layer of color over everything. I like to see the whole painting laid out and then go back and work on each area. So I think that, you know, I could choose the dress, which is going to be a really strong color. I could choose the background. I've got to do both of them. I think I'll start with the dress. I've got a larger brush. Uh, no use trying to do a big area with a small brush. I'm going to use quite a bit of my paint thinner and my cadmium red light. And cadmium red light is an insane color. It is just so out of control. It is so strong, but it's so beautiful. So you've got to kind of rein it back a little bit. And of course, white will help cool anything you add it to. You can see the difference in that now with the white in it. It still looks really beautiful, but it is cooler. And I think, see, you don't have to get worried about anything. All that's going to end up being kind of the color of the sky anyway, so that's all okay. Um, and as we talked about with transparent fabric, you create that feeling with darker outlines, which kind of makes it very simple, because you have the thickness of the fabric that you're looking through, and the seams of the fabric are always darker. So I can kind of just go ahead and do an outline of where I want parts of the dress, and I'm gonna, there will be quite a bit of it showing here. And of course her hair is going to be darker, Maybe I should go ahead and get that bit in. As I work, I kind I put, you might put down one stroke and say, oh my gosh, this other piece has got to be changed. Every time you add to the painting, it's going to change the look of everything that's already there. That is just the nature of the beast. But it kind of helps you. It tells you that something needs, now, yellow ochre is very opaque. And so that's kind of good. You really have to get used to different kinds of yellows. Um, the cadmium yellows and yellow ochre are all pretty opaque. So if you add them to dark colors to make a green, it's going to make a green, but it's going to make it a whole lot lighter than your ultramarine or your black was. So I use transparent yellow medium a lot of times if I want to make a dark yellow or a green that stays dark. But in this painting, I have my yellows as kind of lights. I'm not going to worry about that. That's just kind of an extra thing. It's nice to have that in your toolkit, two different kinds of yellows. So I'm going to go ahead and get this dark of her hair in here, since this is going to be the darkest part of the painting. And there will be some difference between cool and warm, but I just kind of want to get some of that darkness there. So I kind of can gauge. And then whenever you're drawing ahead, always look at it and see where the top point of it is with the horizontal line. It's so easy to get it out of round. And so it's kind of right about there. 
All right, now my red I can gauge better. And her face, of course, is in the shadow. I think I will go ahead and put kind of a shadowy color. I'm going to add some white. That's going to cool it down. Even though it's in the shade, I had this sunset kind of glow coming all the way around her. So I'm just going to go ahead and kind of, I'm afraid I am a trial by error and an approximate kind of painter. I just, it would be lovely if I could do it all perfect the first time, but I just don't seem to be able to do that. Everyone has a different way of doing it. Everyone is good at a different thing. So, you know, at some point you just learn everything you can and try different things and then it's again kind of like your handwriting. There's only so much you can do with it. And then when fabric is transparent, you can see the object that's behind it through it, but it'll change the color. So I'm not going to leave that red, really red. I'll have some of the skin color that comes through. Okay, now I can kind of gauge this red a little better. I love the shape of these sleeves. I made them that way intentionally so I would have these kind of interesting little shapes here. And everywhere the fabric is folded over more, it's going to be darker. I'm going to have some of those seams. I can kind of pull some of that skin color down in there. And I'll just kind of keep finding all these shapes and the fabric is kind of in a, going in folds around her body. It was very loose and the wind was kind of blowing it. So I want to think about what was happening that day when we were out there. She was posing for me. And then I'm going to pay attention to that change of direction that I wanted to get. Back, remember the uh, chicken drumstick leg? I do not want that. So, and I can, I could pretty much just paint her all red and then go back and paint the skin color over that and let the colors mix on the canvas and then fine tune them later because it's going to be a mix of those two colors, the skin and the dress, because you can see through the dress. And then this was all my kind of made up part here. I just like the shape of that with kind of that one little curly cue. You don't want to get too ruffledy and frou-frou on things, but it, it, she is a young girl. She is a dancer, so it needs to be graceful and attractive. And the dress is going to be covering all that bottom part. This is going to end up being a lot darker. I don't want to lose where she is in all this. All right, it is time to do some sky because I can't keep gauging how this is going to work until I know what my color is going to be next to it. So I did want to show you one little thing here that I, want, I do want to think about from the beginning, and that's the color of the sky. This is cobalt blue just by itself with white. It's really blue. This is the color of the sky I want to achieve because the sky is blue, but it has an orange haze over the whole thing. 
So if you mix some orange or red and yellow into your blue, you're going to get this. And if I had this here with the red, it would be bright and pretty, but it's not going to look like it's late afternoon. It is going to look way too bright. It's going to look like it's much earlier in the day. So if I have this next to the red, it's going to give you the feeling that there's blue sky up above, but it's going to be a lot more harmonious with all these really warm colors. Let's see, I need some yellow. And I need some red. And sometimes the only way to gauge if you have the right color is to just put it up there and see what it looks like. See how those marks I had under there earlier, they're just going to go away. They're just going to be absorbed into all that. And that is perfectly fine. Now, that's maybe about right because I know her body is going to end up being darker. I just want to get the canvas covered here. And then some of these parts of the dress are going to have this warm sky showing through. So the dress will have the cool of her shadowed body with the warmth of the sky, and the, the red dress will be over both of those, so it'll look different in those areas. And because, of course, the center of attention is going to be her face, in my reference photo, you're seeing the sleeve. But the last thing I would want to do would be to make this very, very sharp here. That would only take away from her pretty little profile. So I'm going to start out at this very moment while I'm thinking of it, keeping that kind of a soft edge. I do not want that to pull it attention to itself. And then I'm going to, once I get this covered, I'm going to use directional lines with my strokes when I'm putting down thick paint on the sky. It's not going to be totally random. I have a plan. I like to be able to see the strokes in the paint. I don't usually polish things. I think paintings like that can be very, very beautiful, but that's just, again, not my own handwriting. You can enjoy looking at lots of kinds of artwork that isn't necessarily what you might do and appreciate the effects other people achieve. If we all did the same thing, it wouldn't be very fun. <laughs> And of course, I want to save this little negative space down here, because this is important for my composition to have this corner different. And I think I could have her leg going up a little more. So since I've noticed that, I'm going, maybe, she, maybe her leg was a little more bent. Get that in there so I don't forget. And now up in here, I want to make a transition. Remember, I have these kind of lines to remind me that my sky is going to be transitioning in color here. So I want it to be a little more pink, and then I want it to go into the blue. Cadmium red light and white makes a beautiful, beautiful pink, a really warm pink. My idea for the sky will be to draw some attention back to the figure, because she is the center of attention. And I can do that with the direction of the strokes. So as I work on the sky later, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But I want to pay attention to the way the strokes are going. And I'm going to go ahead and paint underneath where the blue will be, because I want bits and pieces of all this kind of showing through. The tiniest change in the features makes her look terrible or good. 
But at this point, again, that is not what I'm interested in. I want to get this all covered and then see if I'm on the right track. Even though the balloons are clear, they, uh, they do distort the color a little bit that you're seeing through them. They, they tend to look a little bit darker. So the sky is going to look a little bit darker within each balloon. And it's up to me how much I want to show that. But that's one of those little kernels of truth that it's good to know. And then you can do what you will with that. And all the balloons have got the sun shining on them. And then they have a shady side. So I know that all of them are going to have some orangey pink on one side and some lavender blue on the other. You could paint all day on a group of balloons because they're so fascinating. You can see the shadow that's on the inside of the balloon. You can see the shadowed side on the outside. One balloon casts a shadow on and into the next balloon. <laughs> it can be kind of crazy. So at some point, you, you kind of need to simplify some of that. Go back to what your basic idea was for your painting. My goals that I established at the beginning didn't include an infinity of balloons. So that might be another painting. You need to just have one point of view, I think, in each painting. So I want to mix up my warmish blue part of the sky and And I want it to be harmonious. I want this whole painting to feel like it's a warm glow. So that's why I wasn't using the bright blue. Now that I have some blue, which actually looks like a gray up here, it might be too gray. Maybe I'll get my little sample out here and see. Well, it might be too gray. Maybe I can put some more blue in here. I'm going to use a combination of the ultramarine and the manganese. And all that can be altered later. You want to get things as close as you can, of course. That's the perfect scenario. But if you just can't do it perfect the first time, it's OK. That's the great thing about oil paint. You can paint over it. You can scrape it off. You can start over. So I'm going to go ahead and I don't want to lose the outline of my balloons because I have them where I want them. But because they are a little bit darker, it's kind of the same principle as the dress, where, you're, where the fabric or the balloon is curving around and you're looking at it from the side, you're looking through all that thickness. So you end up with a bit of an outline, which is very helpful for the artist. So I'm going to go back and knock this outline in a little bit. Because after I've gone to all this effort to get everything where I want it, there's no use painting over it and then having to reinvent the wheel and make decisions again. And balloons are a little bit pointier at one end where the little thingy is where you blow them up. And of course the balloon is obscuring the sky a little bit and it's obscuring the figure, so her hand that's behind the balloon is not going to be, it's going to be not quite as dark as the other hand that you can see clearly. But I'll work on that later. And I notice this one does have a nice bit of this sunset glow, so maybe I'll just go ahead and put that in there. And now that I'm doing that one, well, maybe I'll just go ahead and put some more. See, I painted that lighter color right over the dark, but because that dark was kind of transparent, that's, it works. That's why oil paint is so great. 
anytime you can go ahead and get these little bits in that you're looking at. Whenever you notice something, go ahead and do it. Don't wait till later because you will probably forget if you're like me. Okay, she looks really terrible. <laughs> so maybe now that I, oh, I didn't do that last balloon. Now that I kind of know where everything is going to go, now maybe the thing that's bothering them, me the most is her. So perhaps it's time that I go back and refine her a little bit more. Nope, that's too blue. All right. I would say now I have finished with the underpainting part of the painting. I have all of my space covered. I know basically what each color and each value is going to be in each spot. So now I can go back and start with more serious painting. Hey, would you like to win a beautiful painting worth almost $3,000? We've got a beautiful Joe McGurl plein air study that he's done of the sunset in Maine. It's gorgeous. If you want to have an opportunity to win it, go to paintinggiveaway.com. Just put in your email. That's all you've got to do, and you only need to enter once. We'll be giving away the prize at the end of May. Go to paintinggiveaway.com. Imagine creating a painting that explodes with dazzling light, one that bursts with action and motion, one that pulses with drama. Make your imagination a reality with help from Nancy Boren, an award-winning painter who will show you everything it takes to create a beautifully lit, dramatic painting, from posing and lighting your subjects to making design decisions with your photo reference, color choices, putting a figure in motion, and how to get the most out of lighting. When you think about it, painting is simply painting light and shadows that form your subject. Sounds simple, but how you illuminate your subject makes all the difference. You've probably noticed that some successful paintings show subtle detail on all sides of a face or figure. Other paintings depict bold contrasting lights and shadows. Still others achieve wonderful glowing luminosity on backlit subjects. In this video, Nancy Boren quickly demonstrates exactly how to get these wonderful lighting effects to enhance the story you want to tell. Effects that will impress your acquaintances and thrill your buyers. Discover the secret of three kinds of lighting every painter needs to understand. Ambient lighting for showing full detail. Dramatic lighting for achieving strong shadows and bold forms. Backlighting for luminous rim light and bounced light in shadows. Discover how Nancy combines dramatic lighting with energetic brush strokes to set figures in motion with flair like you've never seen in a single painting. She will help you understand how to master values and color temperature to create luminosity. Follow along with Nancy to complete a beautiful backlit action pose of a delightful figure in motion. Lighting is not the only thing Nancy challenges you to consider when plunging into a painting. The big thing is knowing yourself, what you like, what you're passionate about, what moves you, what inspires you. I have all these different likes and dislikes hardwired into me, and if you can know yourself and tap into those things, then when you put them in your paintings, you're going to really enjoy the painting even more because it's something that you're passionate about. Nancy's award-winning approach to painting will become another important influence on your art by the end of this video, guaranteed. In this video, you'll love watching Nancy's style that will give you a fresh outlook for enjoying painting like never before. Available on DVD or digital to view on your computer, tablet, or smartphone. Order Light, Motion, and Drama with Nancy Boren today. Well, that was Light, Motion, and Drama with Nancy Boren, and you can learn more about that at lilyartvideo.com. Now let's get to an interview with Nancy. I think that 
to describe my painting style, I would say that it's traditional and representative, but in a loose manner. I don't have one ideal subject. I'm interested in a lot of different things. I think a lot of different subjects make great paintings. And over the years, my interests have slightly changed as well. I think that you can find threads of commonality between some of the paintings that you do, and you might even be surprised. One day I stopped with an artist friend of mine in my studio and we looked through a lot of my paintings and I thought I had been painting things like sailboats, cloudscapes, white houses, women in white dresses, but it turned out, thanks to her helping me think about this, it turned out I was painting the same thing over and over. I was painting white shapes on a colorful background. So sometimes it just takes doing a lot of painting and then standing back and looking at your body of work to really see where your interests lie. And once you go through that process and you know now that you're very attracted to white objects in the sun on a colorful background, you can maybe find something you've never painted. Maybe an oil drilling thing that's painted white but with a bright blue sky behind it. Who knows? It can really open up your eyes to other things. I like to add a little bit of narrative to my work. I don't tell a complicated story, and I like to keep my paintings fairly simple. I usually have one or only two figures in them. But if I just add a prop, if I add a vehicle, if I add some kind of costume, I think it tells a little more of a story about that person. Maybe it's a little slice of life. Maybe you've interrupted them in the middle of something interesting that they're doing. And I enjoy looking at paintings like that that other people do. So I just have fun by adding props, balloons, interesting outfits. I don't really know why I like to paint figures. I just do. It's the way I'm hardwired. So I don't overanalyze it. I just paint them. I think humans are really interested in other humans. So I just do it. Um, I think I'm correct in this Edward Hopper quote. Uh, he said, I just want to paint sunlight on the side of a house. Uh, you don't have to worry about what the reason is. If you're moved to create something, just create it. Let the chips fall where they may. My love affair with fabric started when I was a child, I'm sure. My mother has a collection of quilts that her mother and her aunts and uncles made. And I always loved those. I loved the handmade quality to them. I loved the rumpled texture of the old cotton that has been washed many times. And a lot of them were made during the Depression. And so they would have little prints of little flowers and things in color schemes that you know really weren't around when I grew up in the 60s. And I can remember my mother having a real emotional connection to the fabric because she would point out on the quilts, oh, that was one of my dresses in high school that my mom made me and it had a big white collar with short sleeves. And it's so amazing how one tiny piece of fabric can bring back a whole part of your life to you. And so as I grew up, I just love fabric. That's another thing that's just hardwired into me. I love embroidered fabrics. I like fabrics with textures. I like fabrics from faraway places. Um, I just like them, and so I like to use them in paintings, and I hope I'll use more of them in the future. When I was in London a few years ago, I was fortunate enough to see a show at the Royal Academy about the painter Matisse, and he, unbeknownst to me, was the son and grandson of people who were in the fabric industry. I believe maybe they were weavers. And so he grew up around textiles all of his life. And this show was really interesting because it was kind of a behind the scenes of how he created some of his paintings. They had paintings he had done, then they had the actual piece of fabric that he had used as a backdrop or a tablecloth or whatever hanging next to the painting. And so it was really fun to see how he interpreted it what parts of the pattern he used. Maybe he only used the main color of it. Maybe he just picked out little bits of it. Maybe not, whatever. It was really fascinating. And so that really, I think, gave me the idea too. This is something I like in my life and I can use it in my paintings. So that's probably where the idea for using interesting backdrops and stuff kind of came from. For whatever reason, I'm very attracted to things that you use in celebrations. I love balloons. I really love confetti. I love those streamers and ribbons that they hang down at uh, New Year's Eve. I like pinatas. I like paper lanterns. 
all of those things, if you think about it, they're all used for parties and happy celebration times, and none of those things last. Balloons last for a day or two, paper lanterns get torn, the confetti gets thrown away, and they're so beautiful and so magical and they're so important at that great moment, and then they just disappear. As an artist, you should really know yourself. And it's really simple to say that, and you think, okay, yeah, I get it, I know myself. But it is not so simple to really know yourself. Or it has not been for me, I have found in my life. Um, I don't know why that is. There's nothing that interests anybody more than themselves. <laughs> and it's kind of interesting to think that you are even a mystery to yourself sometimes. You don't know maybe why you do something or why you like something, why you want to paint something. And in Robert Henry's book, which is just a classic, The Art Spirit, he tells people, know yourself. Know what you're good at. Know what your passion is as far as things to put in your paintings. And my father was a Western artist, and he was just a wonderful guy. He loved the West. He loved painting cowboys and horses. So as I grew up and I painted, I painted a lot of the same subjects. I painted the landscape where we lived in Texas. I painted old farm buildings, and those things were all interesting. But I think somehow by osmosis, I thought maybe I should paint that kind of subject. I have no earthly idea why, because he'd never tried to direct me into painting any certain thing at all. And I'm sure he would have told me, paint whatever you want. And it just took me a certain number of years of painting and working with this, and finally, more and more and more, I was able to form my own opinion about what I wanted to paint. I wanted to paint figures. I wanted to paint figures up close. I wanted them to take up a lot of space in the painting. I, I do not call myself a scene painter at all. I admire other people's work like that, but I don't feel called to have sky, distant mountains, building, figures, and space around them. I, my brain just doesn't think that way, and I finally have recognized it. Another story, though, about knowing yourself, uh, so many things, I think, about me were formed in my childhood. I was very, very shy, and I read a lot, and one of my favorite authors was Rumor Godden, and she wrote these wonderful books about the secret lives of dolls in dollhouses. And I just loved that because it was mysterious and magical. And I had dolls and I thought, well, what if they really had a secret life? You know, I would never know. And one, two of her books were about these little dolls from Japan and they came dressed in a traditional fashion. They had their kimonos and they had traditional hairstyles. And I just thought that was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. And so about that same time, every other summer or so, we would go to California to visit my mother's relatives, and my uncle would take us down to Chinatown in San Francisco. So probably because I had read those books, one day I was down there with the family, and I was so attracted to this beautiful kind of baby doll dressed in a kimono. And so my parents bought it for me, and I took it home, and so I had my very own Japanese doll with the kimono and a little obi and the little traditional hairstyle. And those things I just thought were gorgeous. They were just beautiful. But then I grew up and my dad did Western paintings. My dad never painted anything from another culture like, you know, Japan, some, something that was so different from America. And so I never really considered painting those. I don't, I have no idea why. I have no idea why. So about... Fifty years later, I was in a painting workshop out at Scottsdale Art School, and they had this fabulous selection of models and all kinds of outfits and uh, props and everything, and I ended up painting this model with a pink kimono on. And I stood there and painted her, and of course I thought, why? Why have I never done this before? I've loved kimono my entire life. Why haven't I done this? And so I did another painting after I got home. I started buying kimono, and I have learned all kinds of things. I've learned that the word kimono is singular and plural in Japan. And so in America, we want to add the S and say kimonos, but I know that's not really proper in Japanese. But um, I started buying kimono on eBay. I have a collection of several of them. And finally, 
I used another pink one that I bought for a model and I entered that and won best of show at the American Impressionist Society with a painting of a woman, a friend of mine, in a pink kimono, not worn in the traditional fashion but just loose like a robe with wonderful vintage paper lanterns, which I also bought on eBay. It's like the best garage sale in the world. And I thought, my gosh, it took me 50 years from the time the seed was planted to when it really came to fruition and I did a really good painting that went somewhere. And that's kind of amazing. That's what I mean by know yourself. Some of those things that you loved as a child may be really valid reasons to do a painting. You can take that fodder and put it into something new. And you'll be really excited to do a painting when you're using something that is really hardwired into you, that's really part of yourself. I have now painted two jumping figures. Who knew, 10 years ago, I would have never thought that would have happened, but it's nice to be surprised. The first one happened because I saw some incredible cloud formations as I was driving through West Texas from Dallas to Abilene. The clouds were tremendous. These thunderheads were probably thousands of feet high, and the sun was shining on them on one side and raining out of the back on the other side. And I kept stopping, waiting for the semi-trucks to go by while I took photo after photo. So as I drove, I thought about painting ideas, and I do that a lot when I'm driving by myself. It's a nice, quiet time. And I thought, what I need is a girl jumping in front of the cloud. And I have no idea where that thought came from. It just came into my head, and I immediately liked the idea. And so that's how I ended up painting Thunder on the Brazos. I did that painting. It won a nice award. I sold it to an artist friend. It was just a great success all the way around. And so I thought, you know, that was really fun. I want to do another one. I want to do another figure off of the ground, but I want to do a completely different color scheme. The first one had phthalo blue, yellows, and transparent oxide brown. And it was kind of cool with the warm clouds. So I thought, I want something with red. So I decided to do a jumping girl in a red transparent dress. And I wanted the lighting to be interesting, so I decided to do her backlit. And then I thought, she needs some kind of prop. In the first painting, I had added some flying birds with the girl. She just seemed lonely. And I had always wanted to paint some herons because we live by a lake and we would see them go over night after night, going to where they're going to spend the night down on the water. And they fly with their necks curved because their heads are back. Some birds extend their necks. Anyway, I just always wanted to paint them and I thought that was a great opportunity. But with this girl, I didn't want to use birds and I thought about a little um, pinwheel in her hand. And I thought, well, maybe that's too kind of silly. And then I thought, well, balloons are wonderful. Balloons make everybody happy. Everybody loves balloons. And I ended up using those in Cimarron Solstice. So one painting grew out of the other, but they were very different. Um, you don't need both paintings together to understand them. They were created as standalone ideas. When I finished the painting that became Cimarron Solstice, I needed a good title. And when I can come up with a good title, I think it really adds a nice layer to your painting. I have seen paintings sell at gallery shows. They weren't mine. But I have seen them sell simply because they had an incredible title. It adds a layer of a story. It adds an emotional appeal for people. So I wanted a good name. And I love names that are short, but they're almost like a tiny little poem. And this painting was done for a gallery show in Colorado. So I knew where it was going when it was finished. And I love the word Cimarron. There's a Cimarron, Colorado. There's a Cimarron, New Mexico. And when I was in college, there was a song called Rose of Cimarron by the group Poco. And so the word Cimarron has a lot of emotional appeal for me. I just loved it. And so I thought, OK, that's perfect. But I need something to reference the sun, because the painting is backlit. The whole thing is about this lovely sunset flooding through this girl's dress. And so I thought, oh, sun, sunshine, sunset. And I thought, oh, those are all such normal, plain old words. And finally, I came up with solstice. And I thought, oh, yes, that's perfect. I love it, because it will make people think about the very longest day of the year. 
And so it's almost like she's kind of having a midsummer celebration there. And um, I was really happy with it, so that's what I went with. If I am having a downtime or I just feel like, oh, I'm not being very creative, I can't think what I want to do, or I did something and it didn't quite work out, then I take a break. Maybe I just take my dog for a walk. I look at art books. I have a whole group of books that I really, really love, and I would really love to tell everyone about this. I went on a tour of an artist's home in New Mexico, and I saw what a great idea he had, and I went straight home and did it. I used to have file folders full of clippings, paintings that I really admired that I had torn out of magazines, and they were all in my filing cabinet, and I never took them out and looked at them. And he had made scrapbooks. He got sketchbooks, and he used big thick ones, with just white pages, and he stuck them all in there. And I thought, oh, that's so simple and so brilliant. So I went home and spent an entire afternoon taking everything out, trimming it, and it was really nice that I had s such a bunch of them stockpiled because then I could group them by artist. Back in those days, there would be full-page ads of Nikolai Feshin paintings, especially Gaspard paintings, that I had saved. So I would have my whole section on Feshin, Gaspard, the Russians, on and on and on. And I sometimes grouped them by night scenes. I grouped them by paintings that have a lot of white in them. I grouped them by favorite illustrators. And I'm now up to my third one, and I have enough clippings now I need to sit down one day and fill out that book. And those books are great inspiration because every single image in those books is something that I already love. If you look through an art book or a magazine, you may find certain things that speak to you and other things that just aren't for you. But this book is filled with my favorites. So if I have a problem, say, with a color scheme that has a lot of blue and yellow, I can think, okay, I know several blue and yellow paintings that are nothing like my painting, but I can go and study how those artists resolve those conflicts between those colors or values. And those, paint, those books are just a lot of fun. So I like to look at those, and sometimes it's good just to quit working on what you're working on. If it's not working, <laughs> um, just stop, um, work on something else, start on something with a completely different color scheme. And I would also like to mention uh, another great book, a book on creativity, and that's by Elizabeth Gilbert called Big Magic. It's just fantastic. It's so inspirational. It's so exciting, and she has a lot of great ideas in there. She writes it from the perspective of a writer, not a visual artist, but everything applies because she's creating short stories and books, and she's trying to sell them just like we're trying to sell paintings. She's entering competitions just like we are, and she talks about visualizing her creativity almost as a person. So I have kind of taken that a step farther because I'm a visual person and I know what my creativity looks like. And we all have that negative voice that follows us wherever we go. Oh, you're not as good as so-and-so. Oh, there's going to be 2,000 people in that competition. You don't have a chance. Blah, 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 blah. Well, that negative voice, she says, and she's right, it never leaves you. So you just make room for it. That person gets to come along, and I picture that person in a special way, and it's not attractive. That person goes in the back seat in your, say, red convertible of the art world projects you're going to do. Creativity goes in the front seat with you, and you and creativity are in charge of the car. The negative voice in the back, she doesn't ever get to get up here. She can yak all she wants, but she can't touch the radio dial. She cannot look at the map and she can never get behind the steering wheel. So I think that helps me too. Uh, forget about that. Compartmentalize that negative voice and you just pay attention to yourself and your creativity or your inspiration, however you want to think of this other entity over here who is gonna be there to help you do what you wanna do. Georgia O'Keeffe, who was such a trailblazer. She did things no one else had ever done. She painted paintings no one had ever painted. She painted skulls floating in the sky. She had a lot of moxie and a lot of nerve to put things like that out in the world. There's a quote that's been widely published by her where she said, I've been terrified every single day of my life, but I never let it stop me from doing something I wanted to do. If Georgia O'Keeffe 
was terrified, but she was still fearless, then I think I can be a little bit brave myself. That was Nancy Boren from Light, Motion, and Drama, and I hope you enjoyed it. You can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. Thanks for watching today. I'm Eric Rhodes. Imagine creating a painting that explodes with dazzling light, one that bursts with action and motion, one that pulses with drama. Make your imagination a reality with help from Nancy Boren, an award-winning painter who will show you everything it takes to create a beautifully lit, dramatic painting. From posing and lighting your subjects, to making design decisions with your photo reference, color choices, putting a figure in motion, and how to get the most out of lighting. When you think about it, painting is simply painting light and shadows that form your subject. Sounds simple? But how you illuminate your subject makes all the difference. You've probably noticed that some successful paintings show subtle detail on all sides of a face or figure. Other paintings depict bold contrasting lights and shadows. Still others achieve wonderful glowing luminosity on backlit subjects. In this video, Nancy Boren quickly demonstrates exactly how to get these wonderful lighting effects to enhance the story you want to tell. Effects that will impress your acquaintances and thrill your buyers. Discover the secret of three kinds of lighting every painter needs to understand. Ambient lighting for showing full detail. Dramatic lighting for achieving strong shadows and bold forms. 
backlighting for luminous rim light and bounced light in shadows. Discover how Nancy combines dramatic lighting with energetic brush strokes to set figures in motion with flair like you've never seen in a single painting. She will help you understand how to master values and color temperature to create luminosity. Follow along with Nancy to complete a beautiful backlit action pose of a delightful figure in motion. Lighting is not the only thing Nancy challenges you to consider when plunging into a painting. The big thing is knowing yourself, what you like, what you're passionate about, what moves you, what inspires you. I have all these different likes and dislikes hardwired into me, and if you can know yourself and tap into those things, then when you put them in your paintings, you're gonna really enjoy the painting even more because it's something that you're passionate about. Nancy's award-winning approach to painting will become another important influence on your art by the end of this video, guaranteed. In this video, you'll love watching Nancy's style that will give you a fresh outlook for enjoying painting like never before. Available on DVD or digital to view on your computer, tablet, or smartphone. Order Light, Motion, and Drama with Nancy Boren today.